Corny, unfunny, not talented. I don't know, I just don't like him. These are some of the most common things you will hear whenever people are talking about Nick Cannon. These people are even more enraged to find out that he has 12 kids with six different women. Although many of Nick's own words and own actions are what caused him to be almost universally disliked, the hatred towards him begins for such insignificant reasons. Nick landed reoccurring roles on Nickelodeon's All That and Keenan and Kel when he was a teenager. He also had various one-offs which led to him securing his own TV show, The Nick Cannon Show, in 2002. This show suffered from terrible reviews and was cancelled after two short seasons, but the show being unfunny and unpopular is not necessarily the reason why he was disliked, because he also had a lead role in a very successful movie that same year. Drumline. This film highlighted HBCU's incredible dedication and pride towards their elite marching bands. While the reactions and reviews for this film are mixed, $57 million in box office revenue proved that it was a hit. Nick was popular, but his roles never portrayed him as the cool kid or the tough guy. Sorry to the band kids out there, but y'all don't got the coolest reputation. I know it sounds silly, but a lot of child stars become associated with their on-screen personality, leading to a warped perception of who they really are, and his next role did not change that perception. Love Don't Cost a Thing, where his character Alvin Johnson is a nerd who lacks any type of game or swag and has to force himself to be cool to land the most popular girl in school. Probably need to uh, <clears throat> roll your pants up just a little bit. <laughs> oh, see, he's a Sean John. So I gotta get my swing on. <laughs> Son, what has happened to your priorities? <laughs> oh, nah, see, it was all about what was under the hood. <laughs> now I'm trying to be on top of the hood. Nick played this role so well that people still to this day think that that's who he truly is. He was plagued with the child star curse, where he can't escape the image of his early roles and people assumed he was some sort of privileged trust fund baby since he was on TV. But most people don't know that Nick Cannon escaped gang life in Southern California. Nick's father James was one of the original members of the Lincoln Park Bloods based out of Southeast San Diego, California. James and his girlfriend Beth had Nick when they were still in high school, which led to Nick growing up in the Bay Vista housing projects around the blood set. His father James got into some trouble, went to prison, came out reformed and decided to move to North Carolina to live with his family and study ministry, leaving Nick to be raised by his grandmother and mother in the projects. James started a new family in North Carolina and had more children, but he didn't abandon Nick. James was a televangelist, which is a preacher that appears regularly on local TV, broadcasting their sermons. Whenever Nick was with his family in North Carolina, he was in front of the camera, singing, dancing. His father even gave him a segment on his public access TV show to do his stand-up comedy as an eight-year-old. He was raised to be an entertainer. When Nick was home in Cali, he took those skills up to local clubs and open mics, and built up a name in Hollywood as an up-and-coming teenage performer. But he got his big break while performing at an event called Laffa Palooza in Atlanta, where he was discovered by Will Smith's talent agency. Will was eager to meet Nick, and assisted him in getting an entertainment manager, as well as his first record deal with Jive Records. <laughs> so he walked in the room and like, within five minutes I had pitched him a TV show, my album, all of that stuff, and he was like, yo, you remind me so much of me. He was like, I'm gonna sign you up for everything. And gave me like my first deal and I feel, I feel like- Nick was hoping that his music would revitalize his corny Nickelodeon image. And I'm hoping that you're interested in hearing about today's sponsor, The Ridge. I have the gunmetal wallet and it just looks so clean and futuristic. It's the perfect size and comfortably fits in my pocket all day. It's really easy to access my cards thanks to this little cutout. I also really like the money clip feature. If I have some loose cash, I know I can keep it secure. The Ridge team is so confident that you'll like it that they'll let you test drive it for 45 days. You can send the product back for a full refund if you don't love it. The wallets have over 50,000 five-star reviews so I don't think you'll be sending it back. I also got the burnt titanium key case as well. Again, this thing has a really clean design and it keeps my keys nice and organized. But my favorite part about the key case is that my keys no longer jingle around while I'm walking. Both the wallet and the key case come in a variety of colors, so you are bound to find one that you like. Get the best offer with my link, ridge.com slash patrickcc, and right now you can get up to 40% off through December 22nd. Again, that's ridge.com slash patrickcc. Thanks, Ridge. Gigolo featuring R. Kelly was the name of his single that peaked at number 24 on the Billboard Hot 100 in 2004. At the time, R. Kelly was an icon. Not only did he carry the song, 
but Nick being next to him made Nick look even less cool. The beginning of his music career would ultimately be the peak. He dropped a few singles after, but they never generated much buzz. By 2006, he stopped releasing music overall. So Nick was not the cultural icon that kids aspired to be, but he was extremely successful and was probably a better role model than most celebrities. I didn't even mention that he was an executive producer of Drumline and his Nickelodeon show. He had two deals as a producer going. He had a deal with Jive Records that he had pretty much like negotiated along with his team, but he was very much in charge of his business. Nick was in a boss-like position that no other child stars could get. His next big move would help him gain some cool points, but he was often still the butt of the joke. Wild and Out is easily his most notable creation, which is a sketch comedy and improv game show that had celebrity guests each episode. It was a destination place for fans of comedy and hip-hop. The show has been running since 2005, with over 20 seasons. Nick decided that he didn't want all the success for himself. He had Will Smith reach down and bring him up, so he was gonna do the same for others. A lot of people forget how many careers Nick helped to amplify by starting this show. Cat Williams, Pete Davidson, DC Young Fly, Taron Killam, Timothy De La Ghetto, Atheon Crockett, D-Ray Davis, Mikey Day, and many others. Nick was the host and producer, so he was very often the punching bag. And in comedy, anything goes, so they never held back. Nobody ever considered Nick to be the funniest or the most talented on the show. He still took it in stride because he just secured a crown jewel as a wife, Mariah Carey. Just a few weeks after meeting, Nick proposed to the 220 times platinum superstar. It was hard to hate on Nick now. He was winning. He may be an easy target for jokes, but he was now a 10 year veteran and undeniably successful and pretty humble. But there was one person who was very angry about Nick and Mariah's relationship, Marshall Mathers and he had something to say about it. Eminem and Mariah Carey had a public back and forth beef that began after a short, alleged relationship that started around 2001. Eminem says that they dated, had sex, all that. Mariah Carey says otherwise. Did you date him? No. Can I just clarify that I did not have a physical relationship with him? I did not have a, an intimate relationship. The feud went on for years, mostly instigated by Eminem, but in 2009, he took it too far. The first verse on the track titled Bagpipes from Baghdad was entirely about Mariah. Mariah, whatever happened to us? Why did we have to break up? Nick Cannon better back the fuck up. I'm not playing, I want her back, you punk. Then he proceeds to call her the C word and said, Nick, you had your fun. I've come to kick you in your sack of junk. He also says, I wish you luck with the war. As you can imagine, Nick wasn't very happy with Eminem's words. His immediate response came from a lengthy blog post on his website. In this post, Nick kind of describes how his thought process was evolving as he listened to the song. He said he initially had respect for him, then he was confused because he heard his name. Then he says he felt sorry for Eminem. And he says, what type of grown ass man lies about getting with a chick? Only slim lamey, lol. Then I asked myself, should I go find this bitch and whoop his little ass? And then he says, I'm taking full action on you, Eminem. I don't know why no one has stood up to your chest yet, but I guess it's going to take a corny, whack rapping boy toy from Nickelodeon to set you straight. As a matter of fact, I think you're going to bring my whack rhymes out of retirement. Your legacy has now been tainted from this day forth. You will now be known as the rapper who lost to corny ass Nick Cannon. Nick couldn't have responded in a more, well, corny way. He admits to being corny. He knows that's what people think about him. And I think him admitting it solidified it forever. I don't I know if you never, want that. I don't I know if you never. want that problem rapping with Nick Cannon. Fish. I would never respond to Nick Cannon. <laughs> <laughs> never. Listen up. Now look, look. The, the camera's on, right? He's yeah. legendary corny. He's been corny forever. Like, Nick even claims that he went looking for Eminem. Uh, almost. Oh, so he was talking about you. Who else out? was gonna kick his ass? I went looking for that motherfucker. We had we had this conversation. Unsurprisingly. Nick never actually did anything. It was actually Mariah who handled the situation by dropping an absolute smash diss track called Obsessed. The reason why Mariah's diss was so cutthroat was because it was catchy, fun, and petty. Eminem turned on the radio and heard the girl that rejected him, but he couldn't help but get the chorus stuck in his head. Then when he watched the music video, he saw himself being depicted as a creepy stalker. Eminem quickly responded with a diss called The Warning, where he held back nothing. The lyrics in this song are so brutal that if you said them today about a woman, you'd lose everything you have. Regardless, Eminem fans think that Eminem won, Mariah fans think that she won, and both fan bases agreed that Nick Cannon lost. He didn't beat up Eminem, he didn't make him apologize, he swore up and down that he tried everything to get face to face with him, but he actually made it worse. 
This guy's good, bro. He's gone. He's like freestyle. Someone should sign this guy. This was Nick's attempt at promoting his new record called White People Party Music. Nick posted this photo on Instagram. It's official. I'm white. Hashtag white people party music. In stores April 1st. Dude, go get it. Join the party. Hashtag good credit. Dog kissing. Beer pong. Farmers markets. Fist pumping. Cream cheese eating. Angry people claim this is white face. This is a double standard. Because if a white person did this, it would get them canceled forever. But many other people pointed out that white face isn't actually a thing. Blackface is offensive because in the entertainment industry, white people used to paint themselves black and act in a very discriminatory and derogatory manner for other white people's shameful entertainment. There is no history of whiteface, and most white people were not actually offended, but everyone, no matter what race you were, agreed that it was unfunny, annoying, and did not make them want to listen to his album. In fact, he even deleted it off all platforms to this day. He also said this. Anything racist happened to you recently? Uh, I don't really look at it like that because I'm the racist. Mm. You're the racist. I'm the I'm very racist. I'm blatantly Please tell racist. Us what Example. I've never heard someone so proud of it before. I am a <laughs> proud to be racist. Okay. I mean, because when you think about what racism actually is, or, or a racist, it's one who believes their race is superior over certain things. Uh, okay. You know what I mean? There's certain things that I believe my race is superior at. For example? Sex category. Oh, okay. oh. It's tough to tell if this is a joke or not, because there's clearly an edit made in the video. You can see when Rosenberg asks for an explanation, there was something redacted, but people didn't think it was a joke. They just used that as a justification to hate Nick Cannon even more. Nick and Mariah got divorced in 2016. There was no drama, bad blood, or a messy story. A clean break. Just three months after they divorced, he already had another child named Golden Saigon with Britney Bell. But for the next three years, Eminem was living rent-free in Nick's head, despite the fact that Nick was making huge money moves. Wild and Out was over a decade old and still successful. He had become the chairman of Nickelodeon and helped them revive their teen Nick brand. He was the host of America's Got Talent, had a deal with Viacom that allowed him to produce any show he wanted on VH1, MTV, and Nickelodeon. Nickelodeon. He had a production deal with NBC, had an extensive list of roles in TVs, movies, shorts, comedy specials, you name it, Nick Cannon has done it. But he still wanted to get at Eminem. Everybody knows I would love Eminem to be on Wild and Out. Y'all go convince Marshall. Then over the years, he was constantly rehashing the old Mariah story on various podcasts, talking about how he really wanted to beat up Eminem. Eventually, it got M's attention, and he responded on a song with Fat Joe called Lord Above. I know me and Mariah didn't end on a high note, but that other dude's whipped that he got him neutered. Almost got my caboose kicked. Full quit. You not gon' do sh I let her chop my ball off too, for I lost to you, Nick. Then Nick responded with not one, not two, but three diss tracks of his own. There ain't no coming back, that's a fact, this the invitation. Told Joe to lean back, don't get hit with this retaliation. So be the king of the rule, ludicrous, lucrative lyrics. Now all you do is just cry like you got the rats in the stairs. Maybe it's your mommy issues. I see why you hate us, pretend you love us, but you really jealous. Wanna be brothers and Christopher Columbus. Nick Cannon trying to act tough on a record just doesn't really work for him. He said the only reason he dissed Eminem was for the sport of hip-hop and ultimately to get him on his show Wild and Out. He thought he was about to ignite a back and forth rap beef, but Eminem never responded. Well, he did tweet that he demanded an apology from Nicholas. Of course, Nick didn't apologize to Eminem, but he did apologize to a different group of people for some comments he made on a podcast a few months later. Nick posted a Canon's Class podcast episode with Professor Griff. Griff was an ex-member of the rap group Public Enemy who got kicked out of the group in the 80s for making anti-Semitic comments. The main comments that got him fired were and we're defining who the Jewish people are because I feel like if we actually can understand that construct, then we can see that there is no hate involved. When we talk about right, right. the lies, the deceit, the how the, the fake dollar controls all of this. Nick then goes on a long tangent about how non-melanated people lack the power of the sun. And out of jealousy, they decided to become soulless savages who destroy people of color. And he discussed how he feels about the powerful people who control this country and was accused of spreading conspiracy theories. Viacom released a statement. While we support ongoing education and dialogue in the fight against bigotry, we are deeply troubled that Nick has failed to acknowledge or apologize for perpetuating anti-Semitism, and we are terminating our relationship with him. Nick then took to Facebook to write a 1,500-word essay about his relationship with Viacom, an apology to the Jewish community, and ending with a statement that Viacom is on the wrong side of history and that he demands full ownership of the Wild and Out brand and an apology. But they didn't budge, and the way this situation 
situation ended was by Nick doing a full-on apology press tour, where he went on various major media platforms, condemning anti-Semitism, redacting his comments, and educating himself by having conversations with Jewish people on how to not further the anti-Semitic rhetoric. He got his deal back with Viacom, and in celebration, decided to have 10 more children in the span of three years. December 23rd, 2020, his child Powerful Queen was born to mother Brittany Bell. Six months later, his children Zion Mixolydian and Zillion Air were born to mother Abby De La Rosa. Then just two weeks after that, he had another child named Zen, born to mother Alyssa Scott, who unfortunately died of brain cancer just six months later. In June of 2022, one year later, he had his child Legendary Love with mother Brie Tiesi. Then September 14th of this year, he had child Onyx Cole with mother Lanisha Cole, and two weeks after that, he had another child, Rise Messiah, with mother Brittany Bell. It's also been announced that he's expecting another child with Abby De La Rosa and another child with Alyssa Scott. So Nick is basically getting three different women pregnant at the same time two years in a row. Now he's been subject to a lot of criticism for his procreation, but not enough criticism on the choice of these kids' names though. He's made it very clear that this is his intention. He wants to have this many kids and he sees this as a blessing. I know you said you won't call him a bad dad, but I will. He's not a good father. He may be kind to them and give them all the financial security and things they'll ever need or want, but he'll never be able to give them the attention and hands-on love they need. Nick has assured people that when he isn't working, he's spending all his free time with his kids and giving them the love they need. I mean, he better keep working because he's gonna need like a hundred million dollars to make sure these kids live a good life. But I'm sure these kids will be grateful he amassed a fortune for them. I only saw my dad once every other week for my whole life and I love him. People aren't quick to defend Nick Cannon because he doesn't have an extensive artistic catalog that is universally loved. But if we are being honest, he has had an incredible career, and the fact that he escaped the projects and built an empire for him and his family is admirable. He definitely let his ego get the best of him at times, and as a successful man that is bound to happen, he may be corny, he may have a questionable view on a healthy family dynamic, he may have said some bold and irrational things, but there are worse role models. I think he's still overhated. But in 20 years, it's likely that Nick will probably end up in the same beef that 50 Cent has with his son today. Hopefully he doesn't wish his son to get hit by a bus. Oh, you don't believe me? Well, check out this video.